This is a podcast from the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. My name is John Parker and I'm the curator of the University Herbarium. And at the moment I'm standing in the Herbarium, which is a collection of pressed dried plants which have been collected here in Cambridge over the last 300 years. The Herbarium contains the specimens of John Stevens Henslow, who was Darwin's mentor. And it was to Henslow that Darwin's specimens were sent from the voyage of the Beagle. Darwin collected his plants as he travelled around the world and dried them. Then these dried plants were packed into large chests and the chests were sent back by whatever means he could, whatever ship he could find. And four of them came back to Cambridge and they all came to Professor Henslow. Henslow then unpacked these specimens with the details that Darwin had supplied and mounted them onto standard herbarium sheets. And these sheets held anything from one to a maximum of 22 plants on a single sheet collected at the same place. Henslow was working in the 1820s before Darwin came to Cambridge on the nature of species. And he'd already decided that in order to understand this area that you needed to understand patterns of variation in nature. So what he'd been doing was collecting plants of the British flora and arranging them in such a way that he could identify patterns of variation in the British flora. At the end of the 1820s, he'd already decided on how many species there were and what constituted those species. It was into this research framework that Darwin came as an undergraduate, and he was then exposed to this whole idea of the nature of species and how to investigate species. So the training that Henslow gave him set him up with the ability to be able to observe these patterns in nature for himself as he travelled around the world. Before Henslow, lectures in Cambridge and indeed in Oxford were really rather boring, The reason being that they were not illustrated. Henslow had the idea that you needed to show students what you were talking about as well as just to discuss the issues. So he prepared huge folio-sized illustrations which he would hang at the back of the room and refer to these as he gave his lectures. These are the first uh, illustrated lectures in the English universities. As well as these large sheets, he also prepared small sheets on standard herbarium paper. And, for example, he would take a particular species of plant and give the whole of the life cycle of that plant in drawings, in paintings. And we have many of these sheets now. So if we take a life cycle, it goes all the way from the whole plant with its flowers through the details of the floral structure, through the details of its pollen, its seeds, its germinating seeds. So on one sheet, you have the whole of the life history of particular plants. And this, again, is the first example we have of these kinds of illustrative materials being used in teaching. One of Henslow's uh, features was that he, as well as being a scientist, he was also an artist, and he actually did many of the illustrations for his sheets, his teaching sheets himself. And indeed, we know at one point in three months he did over 70 elephant folio illustrations for his own lectures, a massive amount of work. But this idea of Henslow the artist comes through into his own collections because one of the features of his herbarium sheets is that they are actually artistic compositions at the same time. The plants are arranged on the sheets in particular order in order to display these patterns of variation, but they are very beautifully done. They are usually arranged across the centre of the sheet and they are arranged in particular patterns such that you might have what looks like a bell curve that is rising to the largest in the centre with the two smallest on the outside or perhaps a descending scale from largest on the left, let's say, to the shortest on the right. They are wonderfully displayed, and this kind of display pattern is shown in the plants that Darwin collected on the voyage of the Beagle. But it was Henslow that arranged them, not Darwin. What Darwin did was to collect samples from populations of different parts of the world,
Henslow then took those plants and arranged them to show those same patterns of variation. So when we look at the Darwin sheets, they're actually Henslow's compilation of Darwin's collections, and they're arranged in exactly the same way, of course, because they were done by the same hand. And indeed, all the plants collected by Darwin on the voyage of the Beagle were collected as a gift for John Henslow. It was later that Darwin realised that these plants were key to the understanding of the nature of species and the development of species and the theory of evolution that he later developed. But his collections in the first place were those that his master, Henslow, required him to make. He sent them all back to Cambridge and we have about 950 sheets and about 2,700 plants arranged on those sheets. The first collection that Darwin sent back to Henslow were interesting but not very well prepared. Henslow then wrote back to Darwin and said to him that if you collect specimens, you should collect them in this way. And in particular, he made a point of telling him how to collect plants with leaves like fern fronds, with uh, what we call pinny, different segments to the leaf. And he suggested to Darwin that he should bend the leaves back when he was collecting them fresh so that you could see both sides of the leaf and fit them elegantly on the sheet. Well, this was in 1833, a letter written in January, sent to Mr. Darwin somewhere in the South Atlantic, and it was actually delivered to Darwin on the Beagle. Darwin then took these instructions, and when he reached the Galapagos Islands, he collected several ferns. And when he collected these ferns, what did he do but the same thing as Henslow had instructed him? He bent the penny back so that you could see both sides of the leaf. And we have here a plant that we now call Phlebodium, a fern, which shows exactly the instruction that Henslow issued to Darwin. Darwin, the perfect student. Darwin's collections from the Beagle are very interesting because they give you the insight into Darwin's mind at the time that he was leaving Cambridge and travelling the world on the Beagle. It shows us that Henslow had instructed Darwin in the nature of populations, the nature of variation within those populations, and how to collect from populations. A very different aspect of investigating nature from, say, taxonomists who just take specimens and representing that particular species. This was not concerned with species itself. It means that Henslow was directing Darwin to think about populations in nature, which is, of course, the fundamental of evolution, because evolution takes place within populations. So already in, when he left Cambridge in 1831, these specimens are telling us that Darwin was viewing nature in a particular way. So from that point of view, of course, they foreshadow many of the chapters that are in The Origin of Species of 1859, the first three chapters of which concern variation and the nature of variation. Darwin was at complete variance from the scientific orthodoxy of the day, which was this idea of creation, that at some point in the past there had been a creation event, and then laws were affecting the way plants and animals appeared today. This was not evolutionary. We have to remember that Henslow was a creationist. What Henslow was looking at was a group of things in nature called species, and the way to define them was by the varieties which referred back to this species. So for him, the varieties really came from the species, but didn't breach the barrier from one species to another. What Darwin did was to turn this whole concept on its head and show that These things called species contained variation, and it was these variants that could eventually become new species, the theory of evolution. And then, of course, Darwin had to find a mechanism for this, which was evolution by natural selection. Darwin's specimens are important in another way. We, at the moment, are concerned very much in the world with patterns of diversity and also the loss of diversity due to human activity. What we're looking at here is a sample taken 
nearly 200 years ago of the nature of the flora as it existed around, in particular, South America, Galapagos, the East Indies. That kind of timeline is invaluable in trying to understand how the impact of humans over that time has affected the flora. So, for example, we have plants from the Galapagos. In particular, there's one called uh, Sicios villosa, which Darwin found there, and he's the only person, scientific person, to have actually seen that plant. After him, it was extinct, and we have the only specimen now, only knowledge we have of that species ever existing on the face of the earth comes from Darwin's specimens. Already one of the other species that he collected on the Galapagos is extinct. So we can begin to use these specimens to understand something about diversity. And of course, one of the other things that we may well be able to do in the future is to use specimens like this to investigate DNA. Because at the moment we're rather bad at extracting DNA from such ancient material. But I'm sure that our techniques are going to get very much better with time. So what we'll be able to see later, downstream from now, is to look back to the genetic structure that existed on those islands and in South America at the time of Darwin. So we'll be able to use them as a timeline. And in biology, you seldom have observations other than immediately at the time that you're making them. There is no continuity. Normally, biology consists of a series of still photographs, not a movie. The opportunity exists through herbarium analysis to turn your still into a movie.